Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, we're so happy to have you with us tonight. I'm Emma with EDF Action, the advocacy partner of the Environmental Defense Fund. Here at EDF Action, we're working to advocate for bold climate solutions and mobilize volunteers across the country to take action in support of clean energy and climate. Many of you here today may have been involved in EDF Action's movement, volunteering in your communities to push for bold federal climate action. Thank you so much for your contributions. Tonight's program will be focused on climate innovation and technology. We'll hear from an expert at EDF about the future of clean energy technology and how innovation will drive us to mitigate the impacts of the climate crisis and create a healthier, greener world for everyone. Climate innovation is a powerful tool. It can create jobs, improve the quality of life for communities nationwide, and catalyze the breakthroughs we need to reach net zero emissions. Now, we'll jump right into it. I'm thrilled to introduce Natasha Vadangos. Natasha is EDF's Senior Director of Climate Innovation and Technology. In her role, she oversees EDF's work to advance an efficient and equitable clean energy transition through climate innovation and technology. She holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley, and she previously served as the Vice President for Research and Analysis at the Alliance to Save Energy. She was also a foundational member of the State Department's Energy Resources Bureau. Natasha, thank you so much for being here and welcome. I'll pass it over to you. Excellent, thank you. It's a, a real pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you for tuning in. I'm gonna take just a moment to go ahead and share my slides here. All right. So my name is Natasha Vidangos. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Emma. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we're doing in climate innovation. Um, for my colleagues, curious if my PowerPoint presentation can come forward now. Thank you so much. And I'm going to start this off with a little bit of trivia. Uh, not to worry, you won't be graded. Um, this is just to impress yourself with your own knowledge or maybe challenge yourself with something you didn't know. Um, so starting off, talking about the NASA Apollo program, which sent a man to walk on the moon, was one of the main drivers for which innovations? Firefighting suits, chlorine-free swimming pools, solar panels, cordless appliances, heart monitors, or all of the above? And I suspect most of you could guess that the answer here is all of the, all of the above. And the lesson of this is that very often you cannot guess where innovations are going to get you and which innovations are gonna be relevant from one field to another. Um, there's a famous story that the head of uh, the defense's really innovative agency, DARPA, used to go into meetings and not give all of these careful careful numbers about how much benefit has come from the innovations that came out of the Department of Defense and DARPA, but just say, hey, we invented the internet. What more do you want to know? Second question for you. The International Energy Agency has estimated multiple different pathways for us to reach a stable climate in 2050. And full disclosure, these pathways are not easy. They require pretty much a full out transformation of our economy globally. What percentage of these needed technologies that were used in those scenarios are not yet available on the market? About 10%, 20%, or about 50%? And the answer here is a little bit under half. Uh, the thought is that if we really are going to achieve net zero emissions, most of the ways to do it are going to require a number of technologies that only exist at a prototype stage or in a demonstration stage, which is to say they're only available in a lab or in early demonstration projects that are just getting going. You can't necessarily go out and buy them on a market today. So that's a room for innovation. Next question, from 1978 to 2021, how has US government spending on energy innovation changed relative to its economy? We live in an era of innovation. What happened to our public spending on it? Has it increased, decreased, or about stayed the same? 
The answer to this one might be surprising to you. It's actually decreased out to 2021 pretty significantly. The amount of money the U.S. spent on energy R&D in 2021 as a percentage of GDP declined 75% since the 1970s, even as the growing threat from climate change made it more important than ever to invest more, not less. But I have a very big asterisk to add to this story, which is that that was 2021. In 2022, something really big happened, which was the passage of the Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act, the major infrastructure bill that went forward, which pretty much doubled the spending on innovation in RD and D as measured by RD and D spending at the Department of Energy from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. So this chart shows you on the left in millions of dollars, the amount of investment that took place. You can see it was much higher in the 70s coming off of the oil crisis came down, stayed down for a long time. There was a peak during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And then just last, just this year, really, we're seeing this enormous spike that came out of the investment bill. So that investment bill really, really mattered. And the politics that got it across the line were really extremely important for getting us a major step forward. Let's talk about the private sector, about what percentage of private revenue do energy companies spend on R&D, 0.3%, 3%, or 13%? And the answer to this one is 0.3%. And there are good reasons for this, um, but energy companies spend a lot less on R&D, and it's largely due be to the fact that it's very time and capital intensive work of the energy sector. It's also comes down to regulatory uncertainties and other aspects of how the sectors are structured. In contrast, aerospace, electronics, and pharmaceutical industries spend 8.5%, 9.8%, and 21.4% of their revenues on R&D, respectively. So you can see there are different priorities here at play. Another one. Roughly what percentage of U.S. voters support federal investment in new climate technologies? 30, 50, 75, or 95 percent of U.S. voters. The answer here is 75 percent. I personally would love it if the answer were 95 percent, but I'm not sure there are many things out there that 95 percent of U.S. voters all agree to. 75 percent is extremely high. It's a very high level of support, and that support is actually bipartisan. Um, according to some polling that my team conducted with Morning Consult, the majority of Democrats and Republicans think it's important for the federal government to invest in new climate technologies that reduce emissions. So we do have alignment on the fact that this is a place we wanna go. So I hope you enjoyed those moments of trivia. I'm gonna move now uh, into the presentation itself. And it makes sense for any presentation on climate innovation to start out explaining what climate innovation is. Lots of people use the word innovation to mean very, very different things. Uh, you can basically frame it to describe all human thought. So what are we really talking about if we're talking about climate and innovation? And I put forward the following very simple definition, which is the creation and application of new or enhanced climate solutions anything that allows us to do better in the way that we respond to climate change. And why should we do it? What's the value? And I think the value around it is becoming a whole lot more apparent as we move forward in time and reach greater and greater difficulties at achieving our final goals in terms of stabilizing the climate. And this is a quote that's coming from the International Energy Agency. They say pretty straightforwardly, without a major acceleration in clean energy innovation, net zero emissions targets will not be achievable. And here's the stat that informed, um, informed the trivia. Around 35% of the cumulative CO2 emissions reductions needed come from technologies currently at the prototype or demonstration phase. A further 40% of the reductions rely on technologies not yet deployed commercially at scale. So, the IEA is not the only one to come to this conclusion. It's coming out from the IPCC. It's coming out from the private sector. 
And increasingly, we're seeing innovative solutions are likely to be necessary in order to reach our climate goals. And when you think about climate innovation, we're looking at this beautiful photograph of an offshore wind turbine. I think very often people tend to just think about that wind turbine. It's a piece of technology. It's something that you can see and touch. But I would love to persuade you in my time with you today that it's not just about one wind turbine, that when you're looking at the scene, what you're really looking at is something that's more like an ecosystem. And we know that this, the climate needs to stabilize with healthy ecosystems. The same is true for the ecosystem of innovation. In, in this beautiful picture of a forest, you have trees, you have plants, you have brush, you have a water source, you have light, and the different plants and creatures of this forest have grown up together. Some of them likely compete with one another, another for sunlight. Some of them help each other grow by fertilizing the soil and preventing erosion. But in the end, they've all grown up together in a way that works and meshes together. The same is true when we're talking about specific innovations and when we're talking about the energy technologies and solutions that surround us today. We may be able to look around and we have a lot of tools we can use right now to address the climate crisis. And those tools are really critical. Using more renewable energy, using our energy more efficiently, trying to clean up processes that have environmental damages and that cause challenges for our communities. We need to deploy as much of that as we can, but we also need to think about what's happening under the ground. So I like to think of innovation as the roots that form, the planting of the seeds that eventually lead to the growing out of roots and eventually the flourishing of an organism that can grow in that ecosystem. And a lot of innovation happens behind the scenes. Many people aren't actually witnessing the work that's happening in a laboratory or at public utility co commissions or in other places where innovative ideas, technologies, policies, and science are being pursued. But they are really necessary to make sure we get to the point where we have a healthy organism that can grow into something that really bears fruit for us. What does it look like when it works? We get new answers for areas like hard to abate sectors, like industry, heavy transportation, places where we need alternative fuels, where we don't really have simple solutions that can solve the problem today. Innovation is very often our greatest tool to address those specific areas. But it can also lower the costs and enhance the performance of existing tools. We're gonna to rely an awful lot on solar wind and wind and other sort of standard renewables to carry the weight of decarbonization. There is value in us making them more efficient, more affordable, easier to optimize, easier to recycle, et cetera. And finally, innovation is also about maximizing the positive impact on more people. It's not just about technology, it's also about how our solutions really work in society and in our homes and in our backyards. And there's some examples here of clean energy technologies that benefited specifically from federal investment in climate innovation. Solar energy costs plummeted by 89% in the last decade, wind energy by 70%, electric car battery costs dropped 89% in the last decade, one of the reasons why you see a lot more electric vehicles on the road today. And utility scale battery storage costs have declined nearly 70% between 2015 and 2018. Just a few years made that much of a difference. Innovation. In thinking about how it works, very often new solutions go through a sort of kind of pathway, a pipeline, which I'm representing here with an error. And it usually starts with identifying a specific problem, developing strategies, building support around those strategies, figuring out the policy and market drivers, and then scaling it up and using it. And I like to use the example of EDF's experience and contribution on methane. EDF was one of the first organizations that found that methane leakage really was a problem for the climate. That was perhaps the most important innovation in the process. Again, not a technology, a scientific insight. After that, it transitioned to a point where we could talk about how we measure leakage and mitigate it. Did the tools exist to measure how much methane was being leakage and could we build them if they weren't ready? Building support among the private sector and policymakers to help drive the incentives that create the interest in regulating methane. And later this year, we're gonna be launching the methane satellite. So this whole process really is one that has many steps, many different stakeholders, and many ways that it can work. It's also challenging to make it work perfectly. 
And in general, there are always ways to make it work better. Taking that same arrow and putting some slightly wonkier terms onto it, those early stages of research are often called research and development. As the project is starting to get larger and scale up, it's often considered to go into the demonstration phase. And then finally, when you're really scaling up very, very quickly and making a lot of a product, selling it on the market, that's generally considered a deployment. An interesting feature about this pipeline is that it's not generally supported by all of the same institutions. So this is a chart that's showing you the pipeline again from research and development, demonstration through deployment, and how many dollars are invested. It's just a schematic, not a, not a perfect num numerical representation. <clears throat> but you see in the early stages of research, it tends to be funded by governments and universities. There's a lot of risk in these early stages. You're not sure you can sell the product yet. So very often it's public funding that gets this work to be done. And then as the public funding starts to peter out, when, the, when a specific product is starting to be created, the private sector starts to pick it up and see it as something that can be commercialized and sold on the market. However, you see that there's this little gap here in the middle, a kind of valley where the government funding is falling off at around the same time that the private sector funding still hasn't fully picked up. That is called the valley of death, and it's con considered a space in which technologies have a really difficult time getting from really great R&D and applied sciences all the way over to the point where there are real solutions that you can use on the ground. So one opportunity that we have is to try to address the valley of death with better governance through different programs. Think about the federal government putting a little bit more in, in terms of public and private collaboration to help technologies cross over the valley of death and become solutions that really deliver benefit. There are other ways also of trying to make innovation happen more and trying to make it happen better. One is to think about starting at the front of the pipeline and pushing ideas into it, into it and through it from the beginning. And that's usually done through a couple different ways. You can increase funding for key prior priorities at the Department of Energy and other agencies. You can enhance the governance and efficiency of that innovation pipeline. Make sure the right people are talking to each other. The right office structures exist. The bureaucratics of the thing actually really matters. Provide rigorous analysis for the prioritization of key technologies. Which technologies deserve to go through this pipeline? Which ones are most likely to be beneficial for climate and who can help them get there? It's also valuable to articulate parameters for success. The federal government often has an important role in deciding what kinds of problems need to be solved and turning to the innovators out there from universities and, and uh, research institutes and the private sector to try to solve that problem. We also can leverage private resources, help make the connections between the innovators and the people who can fund them to get across that valley of death, and generally strengthen the case for climate innovation. The more the general pop population realizes that climate innovation really brings benefit across the board and is a real solution for climate, the more likely they'll be asking their people in Congress what they're doing to help move innovation forward. Another strategy is to start at the end of that pipeline, the end of the arrow, and pull climate innovation forward. What that usually means is to focus on driving demand and getting the markets right through strong incentives like tax credits and federal procurement and regulatory policy that says, we're not going to just put in some money into the research and development. We're going to make it necessary to use those inventions at the end of the line. And we know necessity is the mother of invention. So very often when there are requirements or rules or really good incentives to make it, they will make it. And we also can do really important work on facilitating the adoption of emerging technologies through coordination, enabling infrastructure, other best practices. Sometimes the challenge really is just that the parties don't line up. You can think about the example of electric vehicles in which the electric vehicles are created by car companies, but the electric vehicle chargers come from utilities. And those are very different sectors that often speak very different languages. Sometimes just getting them together is really what you need to make sure that the system can work. People often think about regulations and requires to, requirements to deploy a specific technology as an example of something that drives deployment. You know, if you require uh, that everybody has a smart meter, then everybody just has a smart meter. What people often don't think about is that those same requirements also drive innovation. And this is a chart that I really love. It's a pretty kind of a jaw dropper for those of us in the wonky world of federal policy. 
but it shows you the U.S. patenting activity in sulfur dioxide removal technologies from 1880 to 2000. So over this period, there were a number of patents filed uh, to remove sulfur dioxide from smokestacks. Pollutant caused serious problems. They wanted it out. At first, in the early 1900s, 1940s, 1950s, there were sort of a number of different patents that were being filed. Some federal R&D was introduced in the 50s, but it was really the passage of the U.S. Clean Air Act in 1970 that suddenly created an explosion of new patents for new ways to do it. When it was required, the private sector especially suddenly had a lot of incentive to figure out easier ways to do it and better ways to do it, and they drove a massive ring of innovation. So the policy and the regulatory environment and climate innovation can be linked to each other in important ways. So what comes next? What are we doing at EDF about climate innovation and how can we keep driving it forward going into the coming years? Every year, there's a major appropriations process in which the federal government it, you know, gets its budget for how much it can spend on innovation each year. And we provide consistent support to try to get consistent support to make sure innovation is fully funded going into the future. We also support the implementation of programs at the Department of Energy and other agencies to make sure they're run well and that they really succeed. We provide rigorous and timely analysis to answer key questions on technologies impacts and implementation strategies, and we work to deepen conversations across the agencies and with re relevant national laboratories to make sure that the greatest opportunities are really being taken advantage of. So I'll wrap up with just a few political observations. Innovation, as we're seeing it in federal policy and on the Hill, really can be bipartisan. It's a very hopeful area uh, going into what may be a slightly changed political reality as we come to the end of the year. At the same time, it's not always the highest priority topic for any specific party. So it's an area where really flagging the importance of innovation for your congressmen or your senators is a really valuable goal. This year has been a great year for public support for innovation, and we took a massive step forward. The folks who are responsible for that really deserve our applause. It has the potential of creating a major step forward for the climate but a lot of work still does lie ahead to ensure that we use those funds well. Right now, a lot of federal workers at the Department of Energy and elsewhere are really working very, very hard to figure out how to spend all of that money effectively in a very short amount of time. Future, future uncertainty in innovation funding could also jeopardize progress to date. One of the things that doesn't work very well with a pipeline is having gaps introduced in the middle of it. So right now, the real challenge is how do we use what we have well, and how do we ensure that in future years we keep it moving and keep it going? Otherwise, we really could set ourselves backwards. I'll note that the emphasis on innovation is likely to increase over time because addressing climate change is hard, and it's going to remain hard, and it's potentially going to get a little harder. But right now, innovation processes aren't always guided by climate priorities. So now is a great moment to really see innovation through the lens of one of our strongest tools to address climate mitigation. So you can help. We'd love your thoughts when you're reaching out to your congressman or congresswoman. Think about asking questions about what they've done on innovation. If they were supporters of the infrastructure bill, Thank them for the hard work. A lot of people stuck out their necks to make sure that we had those resources available and they really could be a part of the transformation, just like you. And with that, I will pass it back to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that really engaging presentation and just for sharing your expertise on this issue with us. It's been just fascinating to learn more about what climate innovation is and all of the phenomenal work that EDF is doing on the front lines to develop technological solutions to the climate crisis. And now together, we're gonna to take a moment to take action. On the screen, you'll see a link and a textable phone number to send a quick email to your senators in support of bold investments in climate and clean energy. This action only takes a minute and it has a big impact. As Natasha discussed, we need federal policies that support climate innovation, technology, and infrastructure to create jobs, improve the lives of American people, and drive economic growth. This summer, we have an unprecedented opportunity to move forward transformative investments in clean energy and really mitigate the impacts of the climate crisis. Now you can use the provided link to email your senator, 
It just takes a few seconds using our quick and easy click to email tool. This is a really impactful way to ensure that our lawmakers see the really widespread support across this country for climate solutions and investments to mitigate the impacts of this crisis. And now we'll go ahead and move into Q&A with Natasha. If you have any questions, please do add them to the chat. Great. Well, thanks, Natasha. Welcome back. Um, thanks so much for the wonderful presentation. And we're so excited to cover a few questions um, this evening uh, over the next few minutes. So I'd love to kick it off. Um, I see a question from a member about the bipartisan infrastructure law. And you touched on this just a bit, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about that law. I know that it included billions in new funding for testing new climate technologies. And I'd love if you could just tell us a bit more about that investment and how that's, that's rolling out across the country. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so the infrastructure bill included a lot of different things in it. One of it, it, one of the elements in it was the creation of a new Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. So you remember I mentioned this issue of the Valley of Death. Um, this new Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations is an attempt to really take a serious punch at the Valley of Death and fill it and and create an opportunity for technologies to get across the way. And it is the office received 20 billion in federal dollars. And just to give a sense of how much that is, the entire budget of the Department of Energy is usually runs about 60 billion. So they received almost an additional third of their budget in order to move these projects forward. And that is part of the challenge with demonstrations. They tend to be really large projects and they tend to require a fair amount of resource in order to get them up and off the ground. Um, so the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations will be putting out um, specific programs that relate to hydrogen hubs, uh, direct air capture hubs, some investments on industrial decarbonization and other areas. So we're very interested in seeing where these specific hub projects go and how we can make sure that they're really developed responsibly, effectively, and that we learn as much as we can from them so that they can create positive models for how we deploy technologies going into the future. There are also just a lot of other great things that happened around the time of the infrastructure bill including you know, the creation of a number of different Earthshot initiatives at the Department of Energy, which try to bring down the costs across the board of key technology areas, includes hydrogen, carbon management, other areas, uh, long, long duration storage. Um, there's a new White House Office for Federal Sustainability that's working to green the federal government with some pretty aggressive goals like 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2030 and 100% ZEVs by 2035. I'll also note that, you know, through the, the long and protracted debate around the reconciliation package, uh, there are an additional billions in clean energy tax credits that are being considered and discussed. They're still considered and discussed and still a great moment to be talking to your, uh, your people in Congress and it, urging that we continue to support these opportunities going forward. Thank you so much, Natasha. And certainly, you know, as you emphasized, that's one of the reasons it's so important to have folks reach out to their senators and to have our leaders hear from their constituents about the need for these investments and the, the really widespread support that there is for, for finding new solutions to the climate crisis. So thank you. That's absolutely true. And certainly um, happy that we have the chance to take action together tonight. Um, and another question I have is about um, climate innovation in the US in comparison to other countries. I'm curious to know how our work here in the US in the innovation space compares to that of other countries? And are we really competitive in the worldwide race for technological solutions to the climate crisis that's affecting all of us? Yeah, that's a really great question as well. Um, I would say the United States really is a leader in innovation, but we are not the only ones. Um, and there are other countries in the world that have taken a much more aggressive stance in creating more of those pull mechanisms for climate innovation. So um, Europe and a number of other, other parts of the world have mandated the greater use of renewable energy and digitalized systems and energy efficiency and electric vehicles. And you hear stories of countries that are actually outright banning, um, banning the use of conventional uh, gasoline powered or diesel powered cars in a certain date, certain going into the future. Uh, so the US traditionally has relied much more on the push mechanisms, investing specifically in innovation and leading innovation at those areas. The question is what happens to those innovations when we create them? Are they gonna go to a global market where more often than not they can really 
move out to other countries and go to other places and continue their development in other parts of the world. So it's a it's an interesting dilemma, but also an interesting opportunity because the you know the private sector in our country is very aware of what the commercial opportunities are across the globe, and the globe is moving in the direction of cleaner, more climate friendly technologies. And the U.S. really has all of the tools at our disposal, and the history, and the expertise, and the strong institutions to really lead at innovation. But we've got to keep at it; it won't happen on its own. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and another question that we received from a member, and I think a lot of our members would be interested in hearing about, um, is, is about carbon capture. And I know folks have heard a lot about carbon capture um, and, and it's been touched on this evening, but I'm curious if you could speak about that. What does carbon capture mean and kind of how would that solution help us transition um, to a clean energy economy? Yes, the, there is an increasing uh, level of debate that's happening around carbon capture, carbon storage, carbon dioxide removal, carbon management. In fact, I think everybody's sort of getting the terms down. So you'll hear lots of different words that describe different subset of a category of technologies that basically take carbon dioxide out of the air and put it away. And there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. Some are old as the hills, some are preserving wetlands and making sure that we don't deforest lands that are really wonderful carbon sinks right now. Others are to build engineered machines that can suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and potentially be stored underground. So there's a wide variety of different tools that fit under this carbon dioxide re removal banner. They have very different considerations. All of them have you know, specific, specific areas where we have to be careful and thoughtful and clear eyed about how we use them. Uh, one of the reasons why I often emphasize so strongly that innovation isn't just about technology is because it's very easy um, to, to land in a place where you just talk about how a really cool technology could just save the world tomorrow. I myself get hundreds of articles about this on a daily basis. Um, I, I imagine many of you have seen them as well. But the real, the real beauty of innovation is that it is a self-improving process that looks at itself, sees its errors, corrects them and works to find the best option. It's about creating a fair competition and having a lot of ideas that can compete to be um, to be at the front of the line. So carbon management is very likely going to be necessary for us to achieve our climate objectives. How should we proceed around it? How should we pursue carbon management? How can we, how can we make sure we do it right? It gen generally comes back to the same answer as what we do with all innovation, which is get the metrics right, make sure we're setting the right rules of the game, make sure we're determining what success looks like, and then let the right, let the, the solutions that work the best really rise to the top. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great answer and something I certainly have been hearing a lot about um, in the fields across the, the states where we have volunteers working. So um, really helpful to learn more about it. And Another question that I'd love to cover and that I know a lot of our members often ask about in sessions is about equity and justice. And I know that your program is really looking at everything through an equitable lens and trying to build a really equitable um, toolkit of solutions. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about how EDF's climate innovation work addresses equity and you know how EDF is working with communities on the ground to ensure that our innovations and technologies are serving disadvantaged communities and are really place-based strategies. Yeah, uh, extremely important topic, uh, one that we still have a lot to learn about. And I think how you integrate equity and inclusion into a, a process that's especially one that's a little more abstract. Very often, as I said, you know, the roots go under the ground. A lot of people aren't necessarily seeing what's happening with innovation, but we certainly do see the impacts of it all around us. And at the end of the day, innovation is about creating a better outcome for people and planet. And if we really define it there and start there, that means that all the way back to how we're defining the questions that need to be answered and the problems that need to be solved and what the solutions could possibly look like, need to start thinking about what they look like on the ground and need to start thinking about equity because we live in, especially here in the United States, there is plenty of example out there where things are absolutely not equitable. And there are people who have lived essentially in these sacrifice zones where development has you know, really disenfranchised them and taken their voices actively out of the picture. 
that really can't be the way we go forward. That is not the solution. And that is not effective innovation because that is a form of innovation that's carving out some of the main beneficiaries. So we really need to get the definitions right and talk about how we use innovation to solve problems, not just in a glitzy national laboratory, not just the problems that have been determined, um, you know, by small groups of people, you know, in the Department of Energy, but really that is referencing the problems that we have in society and finding the solutions together. How we do it, it's tricky, but important, and it's worth the work. Absolutely, yes, really important question um, in all of these sessions, Natasha, and thank you for, for speaking to it so eloquently. And I think we have time for just about one more question, and I'd love to raise something that you and I have chatted about before, um, about kind of climate action now, and could innovation be used as kind of a way to stall progress on taking climate action now, and what are your kind of thoughts around, around that? Yeah, you know, it it hasn't been helpful that in recent years, although it, it slowed down for a little while, I'd say in the Biden administration, but um, up until quite recently, there was a lot of talk about the idea that we should innovate, not uh, innovate, don't eliminate, which was basically a, a strategy used by some Republicans who wanted to talk about innovation as a solution to addressing climate change instead of, in place of, any climate mitigation action now, which they felt was harmful to the economy. And, you know, there are very few times in the history of mankind that we've chosen between thinking about what we're doing now and we've thought about planning for the future. It's really not a true trade-off. You need to do both. We do both all the time. We constantly do both. The budget is thinking about both. We have processes that do both. And even when we're talking about um, you know, what the right level of mitigation strategies are, what the light, right level of looking forward to the future is, we know that both of them are gonna be necessary. It's really a question of how you align the systems so that they create the most benefit at the end of the day. Um, so absolutely, we need to take as much action as we can now. And we can't take our eye off of that prize. If I had to choose, I would act now. But I'm here to tell you, we do not have to choose. We need both. We don't have um, an alternative to doing this quickly, to thinking about the now and getting the future right. And that means starting now. Absolutely. Thank you, Natasha. And, you know, thank you to all our viewers and to all the folks online who joined us from home as well. Um, we're so grateful to have had your expertise in this space, Natasha, and to learn more from you um, about innovation and technology and all the work that we're doing. And I've learned a lot this evening. I'm sure most of our members have too. Um, and I'm really thankful to work alongside folks that are leading in this movement to create solutions to the climate crisis. Um, and my colleague will, will drop links in the chat um, on our social media platforms for everyone to find a bit more information about climate innovation and the work EDF is doing in this space. Um, and certainly if there are further questions um, in the comments, we're happy to, to follow up and be in touch with folks. But thank you again, Natasha, for your time this evening. And thank you to all our viewers at home for joining us. Thank you. Bye.